Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome in once again. This is the official world debut of the full review of the Avian Knives Atlas. Now, I've done the official sneak peek. I've done the unboxing, so I'm going to try not to retread over the same stuff there. I'm going to try to make this as concise as possible so that we're not just rehashing the same stuff. I want to give you all the information that you need. If you have not seen those other two videos, please go back in my channel to the previous two videos and watch those and get that information. You've seen the photography. You've seen uh, Avian Knives animation showing how the knife is assembled, how it comes together. I'm going to do a live disassembly and reassembly on camera so that you can see how all of the parts and components work together because that is a major part of what makes this knife special. So we're going to get into the specs of this knife. We're going to talk about what this knife is, what this knife is not. I'm going to give you my thoughts on it and tell you hopefully everything that you need to know. So let's start first things first. The Avian Knives Atlas is a semi-custom, low-production knife. This is not a production knife. It is not a mid-tech knife. That means these are not being mass-produced. They will not always be available. They will come out in very, very, very small batches because they are being handmade. I will delve more into that. I just want to very briefly touch on that so that you understand that. Uh, the next thing, the price is going to be around $650, $600, 650000 somewhere in that price range. Again, I will further explain why the price is what it is. Again, going back to this is a semi-custom knife. The knife that I have in my hand is a pre-production prototype, so some small details may change. Now, the design itself, what you're seeing here, nothing will change. Visually, nothing will change. Some things about how internally it operates, how it's fit together may change very, very slightly. Just how some measurements about how some of the parts are fit together may change, but that's it. Nothing about how the knife here is represented is really going to change. The packaging is changing. That's why I'm not showing it again. I showed it in the unboxing video, but that really is no longer relevant. Uh, let's see what's next on my little list. Uh, next thing that's very important because a lot of people are asking, and I want to get it out of the way very quickly in the beginning, there is nothing Chinese in the materials or the production processes. It's very important to get that out of the way. I am not bashing Chinese uh, manufacturers or makers or anything of the like. It's just very important to get it out of the way because that is a question that gets brought up with all new brands with all new mystery brands where people don't yet know what's going on. So there is nothing Chinese about this whatsoever. The parts are cut in Thailand. Why? Because one of the founders lives in Thailand. All of those raw cut components are then shipped to the USA where everything else is completed. Now, why is that? Because the two partners that own the brand Avian Knives are Seth Taylor, the owner of GDS Knives, the custom knife maker, who has been featured on my channel twice before with two custom knives, actually three times before, two knives that I owned and one that I showcased uh, that was owned by someone else. You can very easily reference those. He does an amazing job. He's a, a very, very talented custom knife maker. And the other partner, Ritz C. You guys know him on Instagram under the handle Tactical, T-A-C-T-I-K-A-O, which I probably wrote somewhere here on the screen. So those are the two partners that formed the company. Basically, Seth designed and engineered everything about this knife. He teamed up with Ritz. Uh, and they formed the company and they formed all of the ideals behind the brand to create this knife. And they're obviously both very, very excited about it. Um, and just so that you guys know, my involvement here besides just doing this review um, is they have uh, allowed me to do the photography for them. So the photography that you've been seeing in the sneak peeks and everything else on their um, their social media, their marketing and stuff, that was my photography. I'm, I'm blessed to have been able to be given that opportunity. 
So, uh, yes, I've had this knife for a few weeks now. I've had the chance to do a lot of photography on it. And so I've had a chance to play with this knife. That's why I got the chance to debut it before Metal Complex and Epic Snuggle Bunny and everybody else. And I've had a lot of chances to play with it and tear it down and take it apart and put it back together and have all kinds of fun with it. Um, this is a super, super, super fun knife. So, uh, yeah, I've seen every part of this knife inside and out in very, very intimate, <laughs> intimate detail. Now, let's talk about the specs. We'll move it off to the side here and bring the specs right on over here. We have uh, seven and a half inches in overall length. These are my measurements, by the way. They might vary by a little teeny tiny little bit when it comes to their official specs on their website. Uh, but I've got it measured at just about seven and a half inches in overall length. Blade length is right about three and a quarter inches and just a tick over three inches in cutting edge. What you're basically buying into here is kind of their ultimate EDC knife. What I mean by that is when we talk about an EDC knife, a lot of people are going to put a very heavy emphasis on weight. We did this in the unboxing video. This is two and a half ounces. I showed you in that last video a knife that is the exact same dimensions in length and, and pretty much in the, uh, the the thickness and everything is four ounces. You guys know I carry my JK Knives Dwarf a lot. It is one of my favorite compact carries. It is a great EDC knife and I don't think that it's too heavy at all. And at four ounces, it's been great. But then I throw this in my pocket and it's two and a half ounces. It literally disappears. I forget that I'm carrying it. And it's every bit as effective as this knife. And I've got all the weight savings. So it really is a wonderful example of what an EDC knife should be. And that was their goal, to create an extraordinarily lightweight EDC knife that's easy to carry, but would still be a tough knife that would actually hold up to real-world EDC use. Now, their secondary goal was to make it easy to maintain anywhere. That means at home or in the field, by basically being a screwless frame lock that requires no tools to break it down and reassemble it. Now, I say basically screwless because the only screw in this knife is the pivot, but it's you don't have to worry about that because when Seth tunes this knife and everything is done, he puts a permanent thread locker on that screw. You never have to unscrew this screw. When you disassemble this knife, which I'm going to show you in just a minute here, that comes out as one piece. You never adjust that. So your typical thing of when you take your knives apart and you reassemble it and you put the thread locker back in and then you close it up and then you can't touch it for a day because you need that thread locker to set so the screw doesn't back out again, you don't ever have to worry about. That has been set by Seth. Him, he did it. You don't ever have to worry about it. By the time you get it, that's it. You could take this knife apart a thousand and one times, and that is never, ever, ever going to be touched. So, that's, so to you, this is a completely screwless knife. So that's what I mean when I say basically screwless knife. So you use no tools, the knife locks and unlocks basically like a puzzle, but it feels as solid as any other frame lock that you've ever owned. That's what's so cool about this. So you've got a titanium frame lock. The introductory versions are going to have magna cut for the steel. Um, in the future, they're going to be M390. Now, I touched on this briefly in the unboxing because they're importing the raw components or the, the raw materials, I should say, into Thailand for the machining. They're having a hard time finding all of the different steels that they would like to use and being able to legally import them into Thailand. And they're going to work on that. And if they can, you know, get all these various steels that they want to use and import them easily into Thailand and not pay ridiculous, crazy amounts of money to do so, they will offer other steels. Right now, M390 is the best choice. Then once everything is cut, everything is then shipped. All the, all the cut parts are then shipped into Tennessee 
for Seth to take into his shop and do all of the other work. So there may be other steel options coming in the future. But for right now, just think of M390 after the initial release of Magna Gut. So what they're calling, they have a neat little name for this assembly and, and uh, reassembly system. It's called the ADT, the Atlas Disassembly Technology. And believe me, I've had to say that 20 times in my head to, <laughs> to, to memorize that. Um, it's, uh, it's assembly and reassembly that requires no tools, yada, yada, yada. The other neat thing about that is, and something that people find frustrating, people that take their knives apart, is getting their blades to realign, to get that blade centered again. The way this knife was engineered, once you get to the final step and lock the knife together, the blade self-aligns. You don't have to do anything to, so, to align that blade. So there's no pivot adjustment. There's no adjustment to align the blade. It self-aligns. So you have no work to do. There is no tools and no realigning of the blade. So they've made this as simple as possible for you to be able to do this. And I think that's pretty friggin' cool. So that's their goals. Make something extraordinarily lightweight, but there's no compromise for having something lightweight. So you still got a tough type of EDC knife that you can use for everything. And it's super slicey because it's a super high hollow grind. And again, these are hand hollow ground. Seth is hand grinding all of these blades, which is kind of neat when you think about it. Super crazy smooth action on skiff bearings. Let me get my camera to focus here. Oh, and it's got the perfect detent break even though you have that super low flipper tab. That flipper tab is almost non-existent. It is so low profile, but it just works perfectly with this detent. Same thing goes for that pocket clip. It's a very discreet pocket clip, and I love the design. I love how it flows with this futuristic design. But it's so out of the way and it just works well with the design. It's non-obtrusive, and it just works perfectly. Now, again, I want to remind you, I want to show you the animation that I showed you in the unboxing video that Avian uh, has, that, that, that they've made to kind of show you how the knife goes together. Let me show you that real quickly. Whoosh, whoosh, bing, 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 twish, twish. <laughs> whoosh, ka and that's the fancy computer rendered way of showing you all the components and how they kind of fit together. Now what I'd like to do is I want to show you me, myself, taking this apart, putting it together. I'm going to switch over to uh, my, my other video room where I normally do my intros. So I have a little bit more room to work than I do in this little tiny space. It might be a little more echoey in there because of the way that room is set up. But I have a lighting set up there that will work better and allow me a little bit more room. Because I want to try and do it where my hands aren't so much in the way and I've got a little bit more space. Because I want you to see in real time, unedited, how the knife comes apart, how the pieces work together, and how it goes back together. And I want to show you what the insides look like, what the pockets look like, and all that kind of neat stuff. And show you just how useful all of these components are. So let's go ahead and cut to that. When I'm done with the assembly and reassembly, we'll come back here to the table. And we'll, I'll give you my personal thoughts and all that kind of good stuff. Okay, I think I found the best setup for this where I'm able to access all of the knife in a way where I can move around and lay all the parts out and you can see everything in the easiest possible way. I apologize for the audio. It's not going to be the best in this particular room, but I think it'll work just fine. Now, I've only done this one time to completion before this. I wanted to do this... Uh, a quick run through for myself to make sure I didn't bugger it up too badly on camera. But I wanted to do this kind of as fresh as possible along with you 
So you can see that it's actually not very difficult to do at all. As you see, this is a very, very solid frame lock like you would have with any other. All we're going to do is we're just going to unlock the blade. We don't want the, uh, the frame lock to be uh, locked down into the uh, excuse me, into the uh, the detent, and we obviously don't want it locked in the locked open position. And then you're just going to access that little tab right back there. We're going to pop that open. Once we've done that, we're just simply going to push that through, and that's going to allow us to pop that out. We're going to apply some pressure on the back spacer that lets us take out the pocket clip. And that piece of hardware right there that held all that together. Again, that is not a screw like we would typically see holding a pocket clip in place. So that is the locking clip that's going to keep all that stuff together. Now, again, that blade is still partially open. Be careful not to cut yourself. And we're just going to simply uh, pry this open. And that unlocks the back portion. Then we're going to slide... this portion out right here which actually is not as difficult as I'm making it seem was it that side or this side oh might be this side first that's right dum dum this side first we're gonna let that pin drop out of the back right there in my hand I'm gonna keep this to the side as I want to remember because there's two pins one in the front and one in the back one is a little shorter than the other this one, I believe, is the longer one. Now, I have slid out this pivot retainer. That just slides right out. That goes on the lock side. And I'm going to flip this over. And that is going to... Let's see how that works. Does I just let the lock side come right out? Yep, there goes the lock side. Now, you see there is your pin that goes in to the track for the blade. Now I can take out the back spacer and that's going to hold in that shorter pin. I'm just going to leave that in there for right now. That's the longer pin. That's the shorter pin. We can go ahead and push the pivot out the other side once we have. There we go. Pull the pivot out. Slide out that retainer. Bearings, bearings, blade. That's it. No tools, no nothing, just that simple. Okay, I'm going to take another look at the parts. Everything is milled out. Took a little break in between the disassembly and the assembly here just to make sure that I have all the parts, nothing rolled off. And we're going to go ahead and attempt the reassembly now. It should be fairly easy, fairly straightforward. Don't drop that part off the table. So we take that pivot retainer. We drop that in. Bingo, bango. Now from here, we know the blade is in that orientation. Yeah, I knew that pin was going to drop out of there. So we'll just go ahead and manually put the pin back in that hole. I apologize if my fingers are getting in the way. So all I did was I put that pin back in that hole. Maybe I should switch hands here so you can see better. Okay, is that better? All right. And we're just going to drop the back spacer back on there. Uh, what part have I missed? Just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. I think at that point I can go ahead and drop the bearings back on that side. I'm holding the pivot, by the way, with my finger on this side. And are there any other components I need to drop back in place? I believe at this point I can go ahead and put this pin into the rear right back there. So that's going to lock everything back in place on the rear. 
And again, I don't want to engage the lock when I put this back together. I went ahead and put the bearings on the blade instead of putting the bearings in the pocket. I think it's probably going to be easier to line everything up. Maybe, maybe not. Don't know. We'll see. So at this point, I should be able to just drop everything right into place. And I feel all the pins lining up. So at that point, I should be able to drop this right into there. I'm holding everything in place. Okay. So now I want to retain that pivot, right? So I want to slide that pivot retainer. And remember Seth saying you do not want to feel um, any undue pressure. You want to feel, it wants to feel snug, but you don't want it to feel too tight. If it feels too tight, then there's a pin that's not dropping into place, which is what I'm feeling right now. So I'm going to back that out and make sure that, there we go. My pins were not fully lined up. I think the hardest part for me is just getting a hold of tiny parts with my fingers. Drop that in there. Come on. Get in there. Now once I've got that in there, it should just slide right into place. Okay, well, I think once I've done this three or four times, it's going to get a lot easier. There we go. That clicked into place. Sounded nice when it did that too. All right, so now we're going to take the pocket clip. My hands are a little shaky today. I apologize. Pocket clip drops onto there. And again, you're going to have that oblong shape there. Let's just double check what the orientation is. It's going to be vertical. So I want that oblong shape to be vertical. Oops, get back here. Now we're going to apply a little pressure on the back spacer so that it goes through. Now I've got it through. The back spacer is actually pushing up against this. So it's actually basically holding the knife together. But I've got to get that piece in there. So what do I do? I'm going to push down on the back spacer just a little bit. Just enough so I can back that screw out. So you see I'm giving myself enough room to put that clip back in there, right? I'm going to take that clip. There's that oblong shape. I'm going to line that up. Try and do this where you can see it. Now I've lined that up. Clip it back in place. Blade self-aligns. And we are done. Not too bad. Looks like five minutes and 25 seconds is what it took me. And that is only the second time I have ever done this. And everything is nice and solid. I got no wiggles. I got nothing to worry about here. Everything is exactly as it was when I took it apart. Get some nice looks on that. The lighting is not as good here as it is when uh, I'm doing my reviews, but I'm going to take it right back over there and let you guys see it. Let me know what you think. I got to tell you, for those of you that like to take your knives apart and do lots of thorough cleaning and all that kind of good stuff, I don't see how this is not the most revolutionary, amazing thing. You don't need to carry tools with you. Um, if you're at home and you have access to your tools, you don't have to use two different size tools. You don't have to use a T8 here and T6s over here and all kinds of other goofy, crazy shit. It's super simple. You don't have to have any skill whatsoever. You just have to make sure that your hands aren't shaking like mine are sitting here doing it on camera. It's just that simple. That, to me, is an amazing innovation. Let's get back to the review right about now. 
Okay, so that was fun. It doesn't take all that long. Now, I'm obviously doing it for your benefit in front of a camera, trying as best as I can to keep my hands out of the way. So it's a little bit slower. Um, I'm sure I could do it in probably half the time. And after it's been done quite a few times, you're going to get that process down and you're not going to stop for a second and try to remember which pin is the back pin, which pin is the front pin, and and all that kind of good stuff, you're going to get it down just like anything else. But as you see, it is a simple system, and everything goes back together easily and reliably. That's the beauty of this. I don't have to mess with tools. I don't have to break out a T8 for my pivot. I don't have to break out a T6 for my body screws. Everything just, it's just simple. So even if I'm not you know, out in the field. Even if I'm sitting at home, I don't have to get up and go over and break out my Torx tools to do anything that I want to do. That's the beauty of this knife. And the other beautiful thing is it doesn't look like it breaks down. It looks like these are just milled lines. It looks like this is just a raised portion of this titanium that's been satin finished and milled. It looks like design elements that's built into this knife, yet the whole thing comes apart like a friggin' transformer, and it's quite surprising. I like the fact they didn't just cut pockets into the frame just to make it lightweight. They didn't just cut pockets, they skeletonized it. And then they found the key areas that needed to be reinforced. So... You know, they said they took inspiration from the skeletal structures of a bird, which is where the avian name comes from. So their idea was to make it lightweight, but still maintain strength and rigidity. And when I've put it up against, I don't want to use an integral for, for the comparison, but when I've put it up against other titanium folders that I've got, I don't feel any real difference. I can sit here and twist and torque on it and, and cut things. And, you know, obviously this, the, the, the knives that I'm holding here, they're EDC knives. They're not overbuilt knives. They're not Medfords. They're not DSK Tacticals. They're not Direwares. They're not out there uh, being used like hammers and chisels. That's not what these knives that I've been bringing out here are designed for. They're meant to be EDC knives, and they could be harder-use EDC knives. So in that vein, I don't feel any difference. Yet I know I can take this apart in a minute or two just by sliding things out and unlocking things, and it feels every bit as solid as knives that are bolted together. And I just think that's such a cool concept. And it's, it's not, it doesn't feel like it's a, a hokey thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't feel like they designed it to be different just to be different, you know? Like they, they designed it purposefully for the people that have that, they feel that they have that need. I myself generally do not tear down my knives. I'm of that mindset that if, if I've gotten so much dirt and debris inside of my knife, I know how to clean it without taking it apart. I spray, power spray WD-40 in those bearings inside that knife, and I douse it, and I power spray it, and then I force it out with compressed air, and I clean it all out, and it gets all dry, and everything gets forced out, and then... That's it. I mean, it's a bearing knife, so I'm not obviously not putting any lubrication in the bearings because you don't lubricate bearings. And if anything, I might put a tiny little smidgen of a part of a drop, maybe on the detent ball, and then I'm done. The knife's clean. If for some reason I'm really out there abusing my knife and I dropped it in mud and it really got nasty and I felt like tearing my knife down then I would want it to be this knife. I would want it to be something so simple that maybe I don't need to use tools, but the most important thing, that I don't have to fight to realign that blade. Because even something as simple as a, you know, a hinderer or, or a sebenza, 
how many times have you seen somebody on forums and in and, and Facebook groups going, damn it, I can't get the friggin' blade to realign for some reason? Even though we, we know it's simple, it can still be challenging every now and then. And this just, it just takes out all the guesswork. Um, so I think it's kind of nice. It's also nice the fact that it's slim, especially in, in this direction, which is important for pocket carry. It's slim, but it doesn't feel... It doesn't feel delicate or puny. And to me, that's important. It feels like it doesn't matter what I decide I want to use it for. It feels like it's going to be up for that. It's a zero compromise EDC carry, I guess is the best way to put it. I don't feel the need to carry a chonker in order to be sure that um, I've got a useful cutter for the day. And I don't feel that I'm carrying an inadequate knife for real work just because I want to be comfortable. And, and that really is what an EDC knife needs to be. And I like the style. It's sexy futuristic. And as you see from a lot of the knives that you've seen in my personal collection, that's a style that I've always appreciated. I want features, yeah, sure. But honestly, if it was ugly, I don't care how well it performs. I can find lots of knives that perform, but I also want it to look good too. It, it, it does need to be cool. It needs to sing to me. Otherwise, I'm just going to reach for another one of the hundred knives in my collection. That's just the way it is. And that's why a lot of knives will go in and out of our collections, to be honest with you. We'll find a knife that may suit a particular need, whether it be a functional need or we think it's cool when we order it. And then what happens is it ends up in our collection and we end up reaching for other knives in our collection far more often. And then we're like, eh, I like the knife, but I'm just never reaching for it. I'm going to trade it or sell it uh, to put another knife in my collection that I'm just, uh, I think I'm just going to carry more often. And I don't think I'm going to do that with this knife. I think this is a knife that it kind of fires on all cylinders for me. It's going to be a great super slicey cutter. It's a really great super thin hollow grind. Um, this particular version, 62 Rockwell on a uh, on a Magna Cut blade. So I think it's going to hold an edge for a good long time. It's going to have really good toughness. Obviously, great stainless properties. Uh, I don't have to worry about it rusting or anything like that. It fits my hand very, very well. It's comfortable. Uh, it fits in my pocket very well. It's unobtrusive. If I'm wearing lightweight shorts or if I'm wearing heavy denim jeans, it doesn't matter. I barely know that it's there. But yet when I pull it out, it's a full enough size blade that it, it's going to live up to what I need it to. It's thick enough blade stock that I don't feel that it's wimpy. Um, it's thin enough behind the edge that it's super slicey. Yet he's thickening it up just a little bit at the tip so that it's a good enough piercer that I don't feel like I'm going to bend or break my tip easily. It's a super smooth action that it gives me that fidget factor that I enjoy in a flipper. It's a beautiful design. It's that futuristic look that I like in a titanium frame lock. So it does everything that I shop for. Then on top of that, I like the fact that it's a semi-custom knife. It's not a production knife. I do like the fact that there is exclusivity built into that. Not everybody that I know is going to own one. It is going to have some speciality to it. I do like the fact that it is a handmade product. I do enjoy the fact that it is an American-made product. So there's a lot wrapped up into one knife. There's a lot wrapped up into that one investment. And I do feel that it's an investment that I'm going to get a lot back on. So for me, it just works. For you, that's yet to be determined. Is it the right style of knife for you? Is, is, it, is it answering, is it filling all the needs that you have for this style of knife, for an EDC style knife? No, if you're looking for a pry bar, go buy a Medford Praetorian. That's a different type of knife. That's not the niche that they're trying to fill here. They're really looking for a specific, and I don't even want to say specific because it's such a broad range. They're trying to fill a very wide niche, the EDC customer, a one knife that sort of does it all. 
everyday carry without compromise. And yeah, I do have some great knives in that category as well. They just don't quite look as good as this. So I kind of think I might reach for this a little bit more often just because of that. Because it'll do what those other knives do. And it's a bit more stylish. It's a bit more cool. And man, it's got a cool story behind it. And if I'm sitting around with my buddies and we have that kind of time and I'm in a controlled environment where I'm not going to lose tiny parts, let's be real, you know, um, I can sit there and take it apart and go, ah, look what I can do. It's kind of neat. So anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Uh, I've given you what I feel is the, the best presentation I can showing everything that I can and hopefully touching on all the important points. I don't know, but if you have any questions, uh, throw them down below. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, don't forget also, uh, I know that, uh, metal complex is going to be uploading his video on this soon. These guys are going to be at blade show. I don't know how many knives that Seth is going to have with him. Um, I don't know if they're going to have any knives available. I was told somewhere around maybe a dozen, possibly more, will be available for sale at Blade Show. Uh, but you can't hold me to that because I just don't know. I really don't know what they're doing. So, But at the very least, if you're going to Blade Show, you can talk to Seth. You can play with his knife. He will have at least one on him, and you can see what it's all about. They will be opening up the first batch pre-order shortly and you'll be able to uh, hopefully get in and get one for yourself. And what else? Uh, so I know Metal Complex will be doing a review shortly in a week or so, somewhere close to Blade Show. Um, and I know a couple of other guys uh, that are up on the list. They'll be getting, somebody's going to be getting this one, and then um, some, I don't know, some other, I guess, pre-production prototypes will be making the rounds. So uh, I, I can't wait until... I get my hands on one for myself that will be mine. I am very, 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 very much looking forward to that because I honestly, truly believe that this is going to replace at least two or three knives in my personal collection. That's the way that I see it. So I'm very, very excited about this project. So anyway, them is my thoughts. If you have any questions, put them down below and uh, I will see you guys on the next video.